Good. Thank you very much. It's nice to know that our innocence has been lost. Um, very pleased to introduce you to Dennis Pym. Uh, I'm Dennis myself. <laughs> Good to meet you. Um, now, Dennis Pym uh, is currently at the London Graduate Business School. Uh, he's got works in research there. And he has a, um, a program which he's going to talk to us a little bit about. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I, I'm sure that you, uh, the title that we've given here is not quite what Perfect. he is going to say. Perfect. It is yeah, with Paul, then, in that case. It, it, uh, I, I said that rather hesitantly, because I had told him that it wasn't quite right. But that's only because it's one of the problems of having to write these things down and knowing that it's always wrong. Right, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Top, the topic is a bit disturbing. It, but <coughs> you might think that I'm the Pope's rep here to talk about uh, the church and birth control. Um, actually, I've got, I've got quite a lot to say about uh, Catholicism. I actually believe it's the Catholics who will say this. Um, we've had a number of people mentioned today, and I mean by Catholics, people like Nader, because he believes in capitalism. It's going to have more impact on changing and shaping capitalism than any Trotsky you like to think of. Uh, Illich is going to have more impact on education because he believes in learning. He's a true Catholic. Um, and we've had the the trouble with Luther in the eyes of the Pope is that he took Christianity too seriously. Um, if any individuals count, it's the people who actually believe in the system as it is now. And they're the ones who actually change it the most. Actually, I, what I'd like to do is to uh, sort of, gosh, try and sort of work in what uh, Alan and Gerth have been saying because um, you know, I, I, I pretty much agree with much of what they've said. I, very much with Alan, more or less with Gerth. I want to take Gerth up on, on the British farmer. The, <laughs> as a class of people, the British farmers are amongst the few people who still believe in themselves and their own judgment. And we're awfully sure, although this world's coming, thank God, it is coming, um, we're still right now awfully short of people who believe in themselves. And the, the one thing I've learned about living in, a little bit in the country uh, of England is that as it is a class of people, the farmers believe in themselves and their judgment. Yes, they're, they're, they're making a mess of farming, maybe, but they'll get over it pretty fast because they believe in themselves. Because they believe in themselves. Uh, where do we start? Um, I, I'm interested in, in the point Alan was making about being locked in, because uh, in the same way that those of you who are ar architects here are attacking architecture, so those of us who are concerned with psychology and sociology and so on are pretty much concerned about what we're doing as well. And um, more or less what we're doing um, is uh, helping our existing industrial institutions to lock people in. That's our game. And you know, we, we, we need to do it. You know, we're already in the world of double talk, because we use words like participation. And in a sense, all our current concern about participation, and everybody's talking about participation, comes about precisely because of the point Gers be making, which is that everybody's withdrawing. And if people start withdrawing, then one thing that our captains of our institutions want to do is to bring us back in again. So they, they offer us a, a, new, a new formula. And the formula is come in and participate. All right? And unfortunately, the so-called social sciences, whatever you like, that group of people are mostly concerned about helping people to be locked in. So it's, if we like to, I believe in the words like bad and good, I call it bad, bad participation. And it's all about locking people in. And when we use words like adjusting to our institutions, uh, or expressions like that, we use expressions like uh, expanding their boundaries and so on. We're all the time looking for ways and means of helping the institutions to maintain some way of locking people in. Now, one of the unfortunate facts of reiterating the authority of institutions, of course, is that one does just that. If I can explain all, all of your behaviour, happily for a sociologist, this might be possible, uh, in terms of the class from which you derive, 
Um, that's great. It's a great way of explaining your behaviour, but it does very little for you as a person. It demeans you as a person. Because if I can explain your behaviour in terms of your roles in your class and so on, there's not much of you left, is there? As Gur has been telling us, there isn't much left there at all. So, it is not a good idea to remind people about the authority of institutions. And in fact, one of the ways of getting over this and getting towards the world that Goethe is talking about, in fact, is not to talk about them at all. And one of the ways in which people, I think, are going in this direction is, in fact, by withdrawing. And it's my belief that, in fact, we can't actually get into our new set of institutions because we need a new set. You know, we can't. When we talk about the relevance of institutions, we're, we're really playing a game which is rather like saying, some or other, in the 16th and 17th century, it ought to have been possible to make the established church capable of embracing the new economic imperative. And it wasn't. There was no way. You see, and there is no way in which our industrial institutions can embrace this kind of world that Goethe is introducing us to. There is no way. So, the first thing then, it seems to me, is that we have to not talk about participating, and that means locking people in. We have to take people out of it in some way. In fact, people are taking themselves out. That's the, that's the point. Uh, uh, and eventually we come back to perhaps a new form of participation, which is based more on, on, on something to do with personal spontaneity, personal commitment, and so on. And out of this comes your new uh, post-industrial institutions, whatever they are. So I'm suggesting that one of the, one of the keys, and Alan, Alan said there, what are the keys, and he was going to talk about it later on. One of, the, one of the keys to the problems we're engaged in now, one of the keys, and there must be a number, this is one withdrawal. Because there's nobody there, the thing don't work. Very simple, very simple. And you know, a, a lot of organisations are finding this to be true today, all over the place. There's just people just aren't turning up, they're not turning up. And when they are turning up, they're there in body, but not in, in spirit, which is the same thing more. It's, in fact, it's even more misleading, because you actually think you've got a whole lot of people who are going to do something, and you find that they're not going to do, they're not going to do it. Uh, this, this question, I'm not going to talk too much about locking inside of things, because that's just like ha att attacking one's own profession and the way in which we're largely concerned about creating bad ritual and imprisoning people and disturbing people through things like participation and organisation development and job enrichment and all these kinds of disturbing things. I I'm more concerned about the development of, of, of this idea of withdrawal. I think the first thing to realise is that this, the behaviour of withdrawal is goes right across all classes and all sections of society. It's not just the dropouts who are a very obvious section of society who are withdrawing. We're all doing it, we're all playing, we're all in the process of withdrawing from industrial institutions because we're finding this situation of breaking ourselves up into lots and bits and pieces just intolerable. And, you know, the examples come up every day. People turning down top jobs in the nationalised industries, in large institutions, education institutions and so on. Uh, unfortunately, the press picks it up and says it's got something to do with the fact they're not being paid enough. Now, one thing that social scientists know is that pay doesn't, tends not to motivate people at that level. It's more to do with power. And the point, of course, is that those poor people have to run those institutions. When they get there, they discover very quickly they're powerless. Uh, and uh, the word gets around and sensible people don't opt for these kinds of jobs. So what we now get then is a sort of growth of a cult of mediocrity, which in fact aids the process of withdrawal because it makes our industrial institutions look even more stupid. Uh, when you get the cult of mediocrity, which we now have got, I think, by large across the board, you've got people turning around and saying, well, for God's sake, who in the hell could take the Conservative Party seriously if this is that sort of leader? I mean, you know, I was watching that television program last night, I, I felt ill, I, you know, I couldn't watch it. I thought, God, now what, what, are we, what have we got to? It's like Alan's point, now why don't we stand up and say, this is shit, stop, you know? But we don't. We just sort of go through it and sort of feel anguished and sort of say, oh, God, you know, and don't blame Mrs. Thatcher. The next minute, some other leader or captain of industry gets up and the same kind of feelings uh, swell up inside one's, oneself. The cult of mediocrity is, 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 is there in, in a big way. And we're withdrawing through, if we're executives, we're withdrawing through executive travel. Now, if you're in the transport business, you know all about this, that one of the big components and segments of the market is executive travel. And uh, one way that we've got of getting out of the, the, the more owners, um, parts of uh, employment or the industrial system or those roles are locked into is just to push off to find some jamboree to go to the other side of the world and off we go and there's a lot of that going on and the question of, of absence itself is relevant here too in fact absence is a very interesting phenomenon uh, precisely because it's ignored 
Um, and it's very hard to work out just how much absence there is, but it would be reasonable to say that there are a hundred times, not one time, a hundred times more days lost through absence than there are through strikes. And the reasons why absence are ignored, I would have thought, were pretty obvious. Because strikes, although they're trivial, um, involve uh, the, our major industrial institutions in their resolution, and that, namely government, trade unions, employers. And so they sort out the strike and they say, look, what a good job we've done for you folks, we've saved the nation again from chaos or anarchy. And the press helped this by always using the word anarchy when strikes, if any consequence take place. But really strikes are pretty trivial and they're largely collusive and there are all kinds of funny games going on there that you ought to know about, which unfortunately we don't know enough about. And yet this, this phenomenon of absence is totally ignored, I, I'm almost totally ignored, just left to a few medics and so on to sort of point out there are a lot of people not turning out to work. And it's ignored because it's an individual decision, because there's no way in which our existing institution can control it, except by taking actions, which they all have already said they will not take. Now, it's like sort of saying, well, we could still go back and say our interest by sending back gunboats. We can't do that anymore because we've passed that phase. And in the same way, our industrial institutions got turned around and start saying, right, if people don't turn up to work, they will be punished in these ways. They know it wouldn't work, it doesn't happen. So the best way of handling the situation is to ignore it. It's a very important phenomenon in this withdrawal from our industrial institutions. People are going absent. All classes of people are going absent. And it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, so a kind of this withdrawal, of course, is, is beneficial and some is not. Um, it's, it's, it's beneficial if, in fact, there are too many people in there in the first place. And almost every large institution's got too many people in there right now and they want to get rid of some. So if some of us don't turn up, it helps them to work more easily. Uh, it may also be possible, though, to make the economic system make more sense. We need the economic system just like we need the religious system and we need some kind of post-industrial system of institutions. We need the economic system and we need our achievers. And the achievers are the people who believe in the policy. We don't need too many, that's right, but we still need a few in there. The rest of us don't have to believe in it, but we need some people who do, who are prepared to, 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 to make a success of things, to produce things, and so on. And those people at present are being screwed up by the fact that there are too many of us in there. So by withdrawing from the situation, one in fact is making it more possible for these kinds of people who like being in the economic system to do their bit, to make their contribution. Uh, this question of withdrawal is also evident again in schools. I mean, they're, they're playing in all kinds of interesting ways. Um, we've, we've developed new labels for some of this withdrawal behaviour. This, this, there's one particular form of withdrawal behaviour which the middle class, class that I belong to, and all of you belong to, no doubt, um, describes as dyslexia. Nice label that, uh, and so there are a few sharpies who come along and say, "Oh, but it's just, uh, it's just uh, you, uh, you middle-class people wanting to you know, find some excuse for having stupid kids." There's the some truth in that. Uh, but in fact, if you look at dyslectic kids, I happen to have one, I think, uh, and uh, the one thing that impresses me about this little bastard is he's got the world all worked out. And what he is doing, in fact, is withdrawing. You see, he doesn't learn to read or write. And that's all education is about, reading and writing. So he, just, he, just, he goes through that experience without it affecting him in any negative, negative and positive, but negative way at all. I think largely negative. Because what impresses me about this child is his capacity to cope. Um, I'll just give you an illustration. I mean, there are all kinds of examples one can give, but my wife insisted on sending all the kids off to France for a term, my wife's friend. And uh, I was worried about this kid because I said he can't, even, he can't even cope with English. So what are we doing sending him off to France? And she said, well, I wanted to have a bit of French education what the French are like, the, the, the rules of this. So I said, well, all right. Well, and I was very worried. I, I felt a bit sensitive towards this child because I keep on getting these bad reports from school, you see. And uh, anyway, you know what happened? He was the only one that made a go of it. It was a fantastic success. He got in with a family, none of whom spoke English. He picked up a bit of patois. He managed to get in with the local kids. He was taking part in all their plays and all the kinds of games. When we got down there to pick him up at Christmas time, we said, well, who wants to stay? He said, I think I'll stay a bit longer. <laughs> now, now, this is meant to be the stupid backward kid. He's suffering from dyslexia. Now, what I'm saying is that he's, he's learnt the game of his draw very early on. And he's going through education without suffering from it. Okay? <laughs> um, and then again, there are other kinds of things the government are doing. And, and doing every day to encourage withdrawals as, 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 a, as a response to, to, to the present crisis. <coughs> um, when you put up prices, when you put up rail fares, when you put up the cost of food and meals and so on, you, with, you encourage withdrawal because now people begin to weigh, weigh up the cost, don't they? I mean, you get so much 
if you go on the dull, and you get so much if you're a clerk working in the East End of London or in the city somewhere. Now, if you actually begin to work it out in terms of the commuting costs from Colchester, where a lot of clerks that I know come from, um, and you begin to work out what it is to dress yourself and pay for your meals and so on, you, you, you very quickly get to the point where you realise it's better to go on the dull. You know, it, just, it doesn't pay to work anymore. So the present crisis of inflation, in fact, is also encouraging this withdrawal behaviour. So there's a lot, of, a lot going on which is encouraging, quite apart from the cult of trying to find oneself and, and discover oneself. Now, I think this withdrawal behaviour is important because I think it's the only way in which one, in fact, can begin to discover what one wants and what one believes in. I don't think we've really got any idea yet about what our post-industrial institutions might look like. Now, lots of people are playing our friends of the games, but there's no real consensus, and some kind of consensus is necessary, you know, because the industrial myth didn't come from nowhere. And a lot of people were being fed, and through education, the importance of rationality, beginning to accept this kind of way of looking at the world, before uh, the Industrial Revolution, as we know, really took off. So there's a process of development there, and uh, to, to a large extent it was, it was intuitive, imp implicit, whatever you like, it wasn't explicit. And I think the same kind of thing would go on here. But in this process of withdrawal, people are beginning to think about themselves, about what they want, where they want to go, and I think sooner or later they'll discover fairly soon that they share a lot of things in common. In fact, they share more things in common than a difference between them. And then you get the scope, you know, opportunities for, for spontaneous participation, and you, you get the idea of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, and housing for people and these kinds of ideas we had this morning. But it will come out of this kind of process. So what I'm saying is that it seems that we really have one way of one way of getting from this to that is to actually go through this go through this experience of, of withdrawal. Yeah. What this withdrawal does to us is very important. It frees up our time and space. And one of the most disturbing things about our industrial institutions is how well they use up our time and space. They use it all up. And if you read Rozak or any of his stuff, and I, people keep on quoting the other chap, Toffler. And now Toffler really is, he's really fall for this. You know, he says, somehow you've got to learn to cope with this. You've got to learn to cope with this crazy world. He's locking us in there like mad. Rozak is infinitely better, not necessarily as a writer or in the way in which he analyses the subject, but he gives us the chance of getting down here because what's he do? He says, look, he says, I know one group of people that have got something. And there are people we, group of people we despise and laugh at. It's the romantics. What could the romantics do? They could dream. And incidentally, that's what my dyslectic kid does all the time. He's the most fantastic dreamer. That's not the reason why I'm in favour of withdrawal. Because he dreams all the time. And until you've freed up time and space, you can't dream. And Rothek's quite good on this. He makes the point that industrial man doesn't dream too much. And when you, when you actually get out of the treadmill of your da daily rituals and routines and roles and so on, you go off a holiday somewhere, you, or you go through some kind of free experience, you, 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 off, you begin to dream again. Uh, and you know, you've got to dream in order to find what you want, to begin to act differently. You've got to have different kinds of dreams. You just don't act from nowhere. Um, and I, I, I recommend to people, if you really want someone who's writing from the American viewpoint, I, I, I recommend Rozak any time over, over Toffler. You know, I, I find most of my mates who, who, who believe in this world referring to Toffler all the time. Yeah, I think I'm not so much worried about the crisis in society that people seem to be concerned about. It seems to me that we're, things are going fairly well. We're coping fairly well. Um, as long as our industrial institutions don't get, don't get too disturbed, as long as we don't get frightened of the, the loss of authority, uh, we'll find a way out, it seems to me. Uh, but there are all kinds of risks that people will find it too disturbing. I, I think one of the discoveries I've made over the last few years, which has been most disturbing to me, is that you know, that old ideal emancipation, which I think most social and behavioural researchers have there somewhere behind it, or you know, what I'm about is enabling people to... to to do things for themselves, to be responsible. Gets rather knocked around. One finds that a lot of people are pretty terrified of responsibility, or terrified of independence. Uh, and that's something one must, uh, has got to watch out for. And in this process, one has got to remember that. Um, I've found myself increasingly going away from the idea about talking about freedom, because it does frighten so many people, uh, and talking more and more about the question of dignity. Because it seems to me that, that thing, what that does to people is to, when it kills the me, it 
it reduces their dignity. When people have no respect for themselves, they have no respect for others. Now, when people walk all over you, it's quite simple. It's because they have no respect for themselves. If they respected themselves, they wouldn't walk all over you. And you know, we've got, we've, that's what we've got to work at. See, we've got to work at this idea of identity, me, and the importance of, of dignity, personal dignity and respect. And we oughtn't to push this idea of freedom too much because it, it'll, 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 it'll take people into the area of chaos. It'll start being worried about turning around to, to old gods and old systems, which we really can't go back to. We've got to find some new way out of the situation. And I think I've said enough. Thank <laughs> you.